this land of Dutch music. We don't know this land of music. Ain't no mountain high, but that's how it started. The Voice17104.com This is Zanetta Wingfield, and you're listening to The Voice17104.com The Voice. 1710104.com Welcome to Did You Know Podcast, your host, Richard Hunt, dedicated to the African American viewers. The program is aimed to celebrate the African American culture and deal with the real and relevant topics that impact the everyday lives of the African American community. Through the frank and insightful dialogue with local and national influencers. Every day, there is another part of the story of the news world, directly or indirectly, impacting African Americans. But we need to look at the shining stars in the galaxy of Black America. Good evening. Good evening to another Did You Know? Well, we're going to have a very interesting evening. I have I brought a young man on as a guest. We're going to I'm going to talk to him about some things to give you some different perspective on some things. But you know, I want to start out with, you should all write a rank note. I keep telling you in this community, we have to define our community and we have to be the ones that's concerned about our community. If we don't look out for our community, then shame on us. You're probably saying, well, what are you going to start out with tonight? You should know. I want to talk about justice. You know, it's amazing to me how the Democrats is always perceived as not about law and order. And we always have been told the Republicans about law and order. But this week has been very interesting, it hasn't. All of a sudden, they go to Donald Trump's house and do a search warrant, and now they question the judicial system, something that we've been questioning a long time. We've always questioned whether it's been court systems, the sentencing, judges, investigators. We've always questioned those things. But it's amazing now how all of a sudden the group that's always been called the law and order is now questioning the justice system. You know, I was very bothered early on when people took the term to fund the police. And as I've often said, I've gotten upset because people tried to interpret that as being something what it really wasn't. What we were saying about the defund the police was we wanted some of that money to go to mental health. We wanted to go to some social services that could take some burden off the police department because the policemen and police women can't do everything. Whoa, they took that word defund the police and my God, did it run. It ran everywhere. Every political campaign on the Republican side talked about how we wanted to defund the police. Like we didn't care about police protecting our neighborhoods. Like we didn't want police to come and protect us, which we in the black community understood it, but the perception was laid out there that we didn't care. But what can I say today? Ever since they went and did that little search one on Donald Trump, I now see people saying to fund the FBI. Ooh. I even got representatives and senators want to change the law. They want to change the law. You never want to change the law for us. And let me just put one thing in perspective, ladies and gentlemen. He ain't the president. No more. He's a citizen like you and I. He ain't a king. He's a citizen like you and I. And he has to buy by the rules like you and I. But it goes to show you how things can change. And I've been sitting back laughing 
It's just like all these years we've been telling people how we've been mistreated until we got them little cell phones. And we started showing every things on cell phones, which we've been telling people all along. I've had people come up to me and say, oh, Richard, I did not know that this happened or this happened. It happened for years and years and years. We've been telling you that, but you didn't believe us. But now that you see it on camera, or you know, you look at the, uh, the Floyd the case, all of a sudden now it's, it, it's clicked on, but that's okay. So I just want you, ladies and gentlemen, put this in perspective. That's why I said we gotta look out for ourselves. Yeah, the game is changing now. All of a sudden the criminal justice system ain't what it was. But guess what? We knew it wasn't what it was all along. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. Moving on. Every time I come on this program, I read about somebody getting shot. Black on black crime. Every time I read the newspaper, it talks about crime and guns. And I don't know if you know this, there was a study, nearly 90% of black homicide victims are killed by guns. Think about it. Let's think about it. A study on gun violence, black men, women, boys and girls, homicides. Yet we're only 14% of the American population with 35%, 32% of homicides. Now that study was published by, you know, in Washington DC Violence Policy Center in 2019. But I tell people all the time, I don't need no studies to know certain things. Gun violence is killing us. We learn to take death as if it's okay, it's all right. And I keep telling you, we're hurting families friends, community members. So if we keep waiting on somebody on a white horse to ride through our communities to deal with gun violence, you're in for a rude awakening. We have to take ownership that we need to do a better job. And what I mean by a better job is I think, and I've been saying this a long time, we have to tell young people that their lives are very valuable. They are valuable. Our lives is valuable. And we as a community got to do a better job of saying, hey, we're all important. And we all, at our point, has to try to do a better job. That's why I say we need to speak to everybody. We need to tell young people they can be somebody. Because if we don't tell them, they ain't going to know. You know? The other thing is it bothers me sometimes. People say, oh, race doesn't matter. Do you believe that? Some of you probably believe race really don't matter. But you know, I try to give you something every week for you to think about. So I just want to give you something to think about. If race doesn't matter, take it off the job application. Take it off the credit card application. Take it off the rental application. Take those things off if race doesn't matter, but I think it matters. Before I bring my guests on, one of the things that I continue to talk about is that we gotta register to vote. We gotta do it. If we don't do it, don't be crying after November. You already saw what happened to the Supreme Court, right? I'm sure all of you have. If we want people to look out for us, we got to look out for them. We need to learn to, re as I said a hundred times, we need to support those who's going to be supportive of us and our agenda, and we need to punish those who don't. So those who don't, we need to vote them out. Just look at this election coming up with this Liz Cheney thing. She's not a Trumpster, so Trump people want to punish her. So their job is to make sure she don't get reelected. Is that what they're doing, ladies and gentlemen? I think it is, and I think you know that. So we got to take that on as well, because I think it's very important. You know, I always try to figure out who I'm going to bring on and what kind of people that I'm going to bring on. And one of the things I want to do, one of the things I want to do is that 
I think that we want to bring all kinds of people. And why do I do that? Because I want you to see people that look just like you and I. And some people could say, oh, you know, I want to be that or I want to do that. And I believe really in my heart that the reason a lot of things we don't do because we're not exposed to it. So tonight I had one of my friends on and I don't call everybody my friends. And his name is Michael Rucker. And I gotta be careful tonight because that's his professional name. And I might say Mike Rucker a couple of times, but I don't think he's gonna get upset by it. And he's a young man that we've become friends, but at the same time, he has a passion of things that he believes in. And so I just want him to come in to tell his story. You know, I asked him, and you know, he's worked with youth risk advocate. He's always been an advocate. And the other thing he's been that I found very interesting, he's a sports official. And so we're going to get in the nitty gritty on that one, on the sports official, because I want to give two perspectives. I want him to give his perspective of being a referee and how he perceived things. And then I'm going to take your side and see how we sit in the stands who criticize and we think we seem to play. And I'll be honest with you, audience. Many times I sat there and they said, oh, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. And in my eyes, I saw that he did it or he didn't do it. So I got him on today to talk about those things. So right now I'm going to bring Mike Rucker on. And he's a nice guy. And what I want him to do, I want him to tell you who he is. And then after he tell you who he is, I want to ask him, what made him what made him want to do the kinds of things that he wants to do? Mike, you got it, buddy. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Mr. sorry, Utley. Michael Rucker. Thank Again, you. thank you for the introduction, Mr. Utley. Mm -hmm. Uh just who am I? Um, just a plain old guy from born in Lynchburg, Virginia, moved here in 1972. Um, the family decided to move, and I grew up in the town of Stilton. A lot of people prefer to that town as a title town, but we'll get into that later on. Sure. Okay. Um, what made you just pick the careers that you have picked? Uh, working with children, just seeing the mistakes that, that they're making as they grow older and had nobody else to talk to, no one to help them work through those mistakes they were making and come out with a positive end. I always tell them, you know, whatever you did, it's a mistake, but we can fix it. I mean, I think that's important because a lot of times I think that young people need that, especially in the African-American community. They need to see positive role models and they need to see people who care for, who care for them. Uh, I don't know why we don't do a better job now than we used to do. You know, when I grew up, I had people that reached out to me and help guide me along the way. And so a lot of times in our community now, we don't realize that we're role models and people watch and see what we do without really telling us. So, so tell me, so what do you, what you would say to my audience, why they should become involved, especially in, as we were talking with the youth. And there are two sides of the youth the side that is going to make it regardless of anything and the other side that needs help. Well, just my opinion, whether you know it or not, the youth is always watching. And sometimes they'll call you on what you what they see you do. You just got to be honest with them and tell them why you did what you did. But they're always watching whether you know it or not. Um, so what made you, did there had to be a reason what kicked into you to say, I care about you and I'm going to mentor them and try to guide them through the system. I guess with me, it all started with coaching football. Okay. Um, helping out a friend who was running a football program in Stoughton and needed some help, needed some adults to come in and, and help guide the long kids along the way. And that's where it started with me through coaching. But coaching was connected for you. So therefore you did it because you saw youth and you saw the need for youth. Would you say to me, I, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think 
especially in our community, we need to do a better job in, in terms of really reaching out to young people. Yeah, if unfortunately, again, just my opinion, in this community, there's not a whole lot of things for youth to get involved in. So we as adults should reach out and find out what their interests are, what they want to do to, to move on through life. Um, you know, one of my pet peeves sometimes is we talk a lot about sports, but there's so many kids that do so many other things out there. So what I'm trying to say, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, you were a coach. And so therefore you looked out to the youth for athletic activities. But some of you that sit out there, that are musicians, people that write poetry, people to get men or people in chess, other things need to step up to the game as well. Unfortunately, sports always get drowned out. But don't you think that in our community, we ought to have other people step up as well and say, hey, I can teach you chess. Hey, I can teach you this and I can teach you that. Because my real issue is we want everybody else to do our job, but we don't want to do it ourselves. Well, that, that's that's true in one instance. Um, I always tell kids do it all, you know, going back to sports, you know, don't just play that one sport, football, basketball, track or whatever. Play them all. You'll never know which one you're going to excel at and, and maybe be your calling. But just do them all uh, along with other things in life. You know, go play chess. You might be a really good chess player. You know, do it all. Don't just stick with sports or just that one activity. Just do them all. Okay. Since we're talking about youth and the balance of youth, what are, and since you're a youth advocate, what are some of the things that you would advocate for youth? Diversity. Try to get along with your fellow man, even though you might disagree with something they said or did. Sit down and talk about it, and and try to make that meet that happy medium. Don't always fight with something that you disagree with. Fight about something you disagree with. Now, in saying all that, and since you worked with a lot of kids, what are some of the barriers that they have? Maybe my artist needs to know what some of the barriers they have, because a lot of times we have not gone through the same situations that they have gone through. So what are some of the things that you think that we need to be cognizant of in terms of some of these young Res men and women? Resources, the, the resources that some of the children have. Um, the traditional home life that you or I might be used to is very different than what they're used to today. Um, Every home is different. Every household is different from the way you start your day to the way you end your day. Every, everything in different houses are different. What do you, what do you mean by that? What, Some, what do you something mean? as small as doing laundry. Okay, so some kids do laundry. Some, okay, that may be one. Making of a bed. Some, it, it's different in every household. Sitting down to dinner, it's different in every household. And we need to look at that. Would you agree that some kids are put in a situation of being in an adult situation. Yes, they're giving a lot of response. Back when I was, when we were children, the responsibilities that we had versus the responsibilities that the children have today, totally different. Uh, some children, as, as a young teenager, they're instant babysitters, and they they got to take on that responsibility of almost raising a child with very little guidance of, from them from, for themselves. So how do you think that we can do a better job at that? Maybe bring back in the daycare centers that they had back in the 70s. Okay. That's what helped raise myself and a lot of my peers were daycare centers before and after school programs. They exist, but I don't think they're, the child is there long enough. At a certain age, they kind of let the child go loose. I'm saying the parent, sure. kind of let the child go loose and all of a sudden it's instant independence. So you're telling my audience that we need to look at things and we need to do a better job in terms of, especially older adults, don't look at the way things were when you were doing it. But at the same time, we need to understand what's going on now. For example, um, 
well, how do we help young people? And I, I did some research and it talked about, I said kids at risk and it talked about behavior, talked about drug abuse, poor peer relationships. Now, how do we try to help these kids? What do you think we should do as a family, as a community? Uh, you know, they always say that, you know, you need a village to raise a family. So how should we do a better job as a village? Just be there for that child. Make sure that they're safe at all times. Make, make sure that they're happy at all times. You know, you're not going to be happy all the time, but, you know, don't, 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 don't be afraid to be honest with them. Would you say that we need to tell our young people that they're important? Yes, they are. They're yeah. very important. We need to share that with them more. They're special. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do. Would you also agree that we need to stop always saying the great athlete out there is special, but we need to do a better job saying everybody is somewhat special? Yes. The athletes, I believe, gets, gets the most attention because of the media through the professional sports, you know, that's out there in their face. And a lot of kids, that's all they see. So that's what they want to do. They don't really get much advertisement to play in a band or in an orchestra or something of that sort. Um, poetry, reading, writing doesn't really, is not out there in their face such as sports is. And I think that's, I think, first of all, I think that's a disservice. And I think it's a disservice to our community. Let me tell you why I think it's a disservice to our community. We give a false realization that sports is always the main vehicle to get us out of that community. And that's not the case. Sports is not always the one. People, every time I talk to people, they tell me they wanna be football players, they wanna be basketball players. But at the same time, everybody ain't going to be basketball or football player. I tell kids, maybe they want to be baseball, but we don't talk about baseball a lot like we used to. You know, when I was growing up, I know I'm old folks. People say, oh, yeah, Jackie Robinson, that's why they like the Dodgers or whatever. And we don't talk about baseball and we don't talk about other sports and we don't talk about musicians and we don't talk about great writers. So I think that, would you agree? We, we as the community need to be a better job to define who we are. And the reason I say we have to define who we are, we keep waiting on somebody to define who we are. For example, I mean, I'll just take the paper in here. All, ever since I would say June, they've been talking about football. Football just now started, but football, 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 football. But they never talked about, and that's why I have this platform here, so that we can bring people on to talk about what we want to talk about and define who we are. Because if we don't define who we are, I don't know who's going to define who we are. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we all know we've been defined, and it ain't always been positive. It's been a lot of negativeness. I can tell you that. I can tell you for a fact, I can walk down the street somebody can grab their pocketbook. Why? Because how I was defined or how we was defined as a race, good, bad, or indifferent. And all of you know that I call it as I see it. Well, before I go into you being a referee, tell my audience what you think that we should know in terms of youth advocacy, those that might be off the railroad track that we need to get on the railroad track. Maybe sit down with your child and come up with a plan. Plan A, if it's sports, if it's football, basketball, baseball, whatever it is, if that doesn't work, have a plan B, have a plan C, D, and so on. But just don't go with that one set thing of, I'm going to be in the NFL when you're really struggling to get some quality time on a high school football field. So have a plan B. Don't just try to go to that division one college. Maybe a state school would be more suitable for you and build on that. Come up with a plan B in case plan A fails. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna move on with you. I'm letting you off on the hook. 
because you use the word <laughs> parent. What about if they don't have the parent that you projected in this conversation? What should we do? Parent, guardian, school teacher, pastor of the church, somebody that you look up to and you want to reach the place where they are in life. All right. I want you to go back and repeat what you said, see, because a lot of times it's not the parent to do the job, it's the community to do the job. That's why they always say it takes a village. But it starts at home. But every, see, that's my issue. It starts at home, but some people have a very disruptive home. So would you say this? I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt here. Well, not to interrupt you, but as a teenager, you at, at some point you have a voice. And as long as you're respectful, those disruptive adults in the house, as long as you're respectful, they'll listen to you. Now, if you walk in and be very disrespectful, they're going to probably be disrespectful back to you. But if you come in respectful and they state your case, they'll listen and maybe help you come up with a plan. I, Just my opinion. And he's, you're entitled to your opinion. That's why I have you on here, because that's the way I want this discussion to go. But I'm going to go back to I'm not letting you off the hook because you're my friend. I'm asking you to give me your other perspective of it in terms of we understand the real reality of parents. But I hear out here, children are raising children. Children are taking responsibility. So I'm asking you, do you think and do you believe that what we should do as a community, that regardless, of, we need to reach out and be supportive of the kids in our neighborhood? As a community, there are other avenues out there. There's the Boys and Girls Club. There's the YWCA, the YMCA. There's the after school programs. There's other things out there within a community to help that student along or help that child along with their plan A, plan B, or plan C. So what you're saying to my audience is, is that we, we need to do a better job, or maybe we're already doing the job, I don't think we are, but maybe we are, to let the kids know there's other outlets out there for them. Yes. So help can be on the way. Yes, or help is already there. They just haven't reached out. Maybe the help that's there needs to go out into the neighborhoods. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Rucker says to a lot of you organizations out there, not that he's not saying you're not doing a good job. He didn't say that. But maybe you need to do a better job because maybe we need to go out and reach our young people because they are our future leaders. They are going to take our place. And as they take our place, we need them. Would you agree with this here? I'm, I'm gonna end this before we go to the other one. There's a lot of kids that have been labeled many ways, been labeled many, many ways, and they didn't allow that label to define them and they became very great successful people would you agree with that i agree with that yes and that's why i think it's so important to bring different people on with different perspectives now i'm sure half the audience see something totally different than what you said i'm sure many of them see things that i'm saying is very different but here's the point the point is we have some very valuable young people out there and we need to reach out to them. We need to tell them that they are special. We need to tell them they can be somebody because I have gone around and I've done some motivational speaking. And one of the things I found out when I talked to a group of young people, I told them they could be anything they wanted to be. And that was the first time that somebody told them they could be whatever they wanted to be. They heard all the negatives. You ain't going to be this. You ain't going to be that. They've heard that from parents, relatives, community, 
educational institution. They've been told all along that they weren't going to be much and they weren't going to do much. So we got to start doing a better job of being the cheerleaders for our young people. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that, yes. So what did you learn from this tonight? Something very simple. We got to do a better job of telling our young people three things. Life is important. It's very valuable, so don't throw it away. And don't try to throw somebody else's life away. And stop taking that attitude, I don't care because nobody don't care about me. Somebody cares about you out there. Believe me, they do. But we as an adults got to do a better job to, 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 to share that. And I'm a big believer of that. As I've said earlier, if we don't define who we are and what we're about and where we're going, what we're going to do. And that's why I try to bring different people on because somebody may sit here and say, I know Michael Rucker, or, you know, he made some sense. And maybe there's some agency out there I can say something to, or maybe there's a confidant out there that I can say I'm hungry. I don't have that coat. Because one of the things, and I'll leave you on this, you know, I use a lot of life experiences when I have these programs. And one of the things that's very interesting is that one thing that's very interesting is that when you told you ain't gonna be nothing, kids believe they ain't gonna be nothing. I'm just sharing that out there. Or whatever I tell you, kids are very sensitive. I've seen it in supermarkets. I've seen it at the mall where parents have talked to kids so bad. Well, they talk to them bad, and after they talk to them bad, then what do you think happens? They start to think bad. So we got to start being positive role models. So I'm going to keep bringing different people on with different perspectives. I didn't bring him on to say that he had all the answers. I didn't bring him on so that he can say, well, I'm such and such. I brought him on because I just wanted him to give his perspective. I want other people's perspectives, but I want mainline people's perspectives. So if you got nothing from this tonight on this first set, this is what you got. You got that we got to do a better job of, of looking out for young people. And even though they may be labeled, there may be a reason why they're labeled. You never know. How do I know that? I know a person. So a kid is disrupted in school. You don't know why it's disrupted. Anybody ever think he's disrupted because he can't read and he don't want his boys to know he can't read? I'm just sharing with you. So we got to balance it out. Or they might be disrupted because they're hungry. Or they might be disrupted because they want some attention. So audience, I'm telling you tonight, look around and look at young people, and see what they're doing and say hi to them and say, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? And stop telling them what they can't be. Stop it. Tell them, help them chase their dream, just like a lot of you chased your dream. Well, we're going to move on to something now. We're going to get into the nitty gritty. Michael Rucker, you know, I keep saying Michael Rucker, that's his professional name, but Mike Rucker. He is an official and he's official for football. But I'm going to talk about football, but I'm going to talk about official or refereeing overall. Because sometimes we see referees as different things. What made you get into referee? Well, as we touched on earlier, it's, I started helping out the youth through coaching. Um, after coaching for a few years, I met a beautiful woman and got married and had some children. House was kind of disarray, so I stopped coaching just to get the house back in order. My wife being a strong woman that she was, or that she is, I'm sorry, 
got the house in order and it's there now. So I could, I was allowed to get back into, into something extracurricular and I didn't want to do the coaching thing any longer. And a friend of mine who I had went to high school with was an official and sitting down talking to him, we kind of put a plan together and I did some research, did some studying, took the test and became an official. Okay, so that's why you became a referee. I heard you say a couple of things in there. You took a test. Yes. What kind of test did you have to take to be a referee? Test on all the rules of football. All the rules of high school football, I should say. Okay. Because there's over 3,000 rule differences between high school, college, and the NFL. So what you're saying is that you studied and you took a test. Yes. So that's important. So a lot of you out there that want to be referees, you're going to have to take a test. So that means you're going to have to study. Now, right? Yes, that now, is correct. Now, let me ask you this here. One of the issues about referees is a lot of times I see a lot of, a lot of referees, but there's not a lot of referees that look like me. Why, why is that? Well, there's a few of us out there, um, but to answer your question, why is that? I can't answer it. I don't have the $100,000 answer to that question. Um, maybe it's a challenge that they don't want to take on. Well, see, this is my issue. This is my issue. Is that that or they have not been exposed to it? And let me tell you why I'm bringing this up. Just like in the paper, they had a big 33 coaches and there's never been one in 50 years. And all of a sudden, oh, I didn't know there was never a black coach. And we have to be exposed to it. But don't you think that we need to promote it because there's not a lot of African-American coaches in any, whether it's high school, whether it's pro. And so I'm asking you, what do you think we need to do to help get more coaches? referees in well because it's it's advertised i mean it's it's in the paper there's flyers around in the community it's advertised i think it's maybe overlooked by 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 our people okay 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 overlooked. so if somebody want to be a referee what, what do they do if they want to be plain and simple going to the uh website of the uh, pennsylvania interscholastic athletic association piaa.org would you repeat that again listen some of you out there who criticize because I hear you in the stands, because I'm in the stands with you. It's there. He's telling you, be quiet and step up to the plate. And how can they become referees? Go on to the website of Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association, PIAA.org, and all the information is there for you. Um, is being a, a referee, is this stressful? For me, no. Maybe another individual, they will have their opinion, but I don't I don't see it as stressful. If I see a call, I'll make the call versus advantage versus disadvantage. You call what you see, and if you don't see it, you don't call it. I can't call what the next man see or what the person 60 yards away from me in the bleachers see. I got to call what I see. Huh. Well, you know I'm going to ask you to repeat that again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know I'm going to ask you to repeat that again. Because I'm in the stand. Now, would you go very slowly, audience, listen to what he's saying, because all of you out there have been critics. Every last one of you have been critics of that referee. So don't tell me you haven't. And I'm guilty as well, but we've all been. So would you please repeat what you just said? At the snap of the ball, I am immediately looking for advantage versus disadvantage. Now, at the snap of the ball, you're making sure that Everybody moves simultaneously at the same time. No one moves prior to the ball being snapped because you can have a false start, which is a penalty for that. Once the ball is in play, you look at the point of attack. Advantage and disadvantage plays a part of the entire play. So I can only call what I see. I can't call something you may have seen from 60 yards away, standing up in the bleachers. Tell me what you saw, throw a flag on it. Can't do that. I can only call what I see. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with what you said, and I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a little kudos here tonight. You gotta be someone on the ball. We're gonna go, we go to football because you got 24 people out there moving. 
So you got to be cognizant of what's going on. Yeah, 22 players. Yep, 22. I'm at 22. Five, 11, five, 11. five, five officials, minimum maybe Nine six, 11. depending on certain certain things. You got coaches in your ear. You got fans at a distance in the air. You just got to turn the ears off, not listen to that stuff, and just pay attention to what's going on in front of you. So, okay, let's go back. So what do you mean by we'll go to the – We'll go to those in the stands first, and then we'll go to okay. the coaches. So when you're out there, are you focused? Do you hear what they're saying in the stands? For the most part, no. For the most part, For the most part, where there's, where, where the, where there's a dead ball, and that's where there's no play going on. It's usually when the two teams are in a huddle. You might hear something. Uh, I'll kind of chuckle at it, but that's just me. But you got to stay focused on what's going on. Once that ball is snapped, you zoom in on what's going on around the ball. Would you say that most referees are very honest? Yes. Would you say? Without a doubt, yes. Okay. Would you say also that they, I said they were honest, and they called it to what they believed, what they saw with their own eyesight? With, without a doubt. Now, um, now, keeping in mind, we're human. Thank you. We're going to make mistakes, but I would never question any of their integrity. Um, okay. Now, Lane Jr. heard what he said. He would never question any of your integrity. But something he said, that I'm getting ready to home right in on, you know where I'm going. You're a human. You're a human being. The ironical part, you can tell me if I'm wrong, referees make mistakes sometimes. Mm -hmm. You agree? Coaches make mistakes sometimes. We make mistakes mainly on touchdowns. And, and mostly, there's people that make mistakes that sit in the audience and and and, and the stands that criticize you. Would you agree? Well, a lot of for my findings, a lot of cri criticism comes from because the individual who's doing the criticizing really, really don't know the rule of the game. So they're going with the rule that they heard last Sunday watching an NFL game Sunday night. And they're half sleep after a long day at church and spending some family time. They're sitting there watching the NFL and they heard something happen. So that carries over into that Friday night game the following week, which, like I stated earlier, there's over 3,000 rule differences versus high school, college, and the NFL. How do you deal with, I'm asking you as a person, mm -hmm. as, 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 as an official, how do you deal with that emotionally? as a challenge to you when I know for when I know for a fact when I know for a fact that tensity is high in football as well as emotion is wrong. How do I handle it? Leave it on the field. At the end of the game, it's over and done with. If coach has something that he wants me to look at, send us some footage, we'll sit down and look at it. If we made a mistake, we'll fix it and move forward and make sure it doesn't happen again, learn from your mistake. Um, it's never personal. You know, if, if you did make a mistake, go back to the coach and apologize. If the coach asks you a question during the course of that game, give him the answer. If you don't have the answer, quickly get the answer and come back to him and let him know. Don't leave him out there hanging at, you know, I asked you a question and you never really replied to him. But you just gotta, you know, have a short memory. You know, if you make a mistake, learn from it and move on. Don't keep reliving that same mistake. So you're saying to my audience as a referee, folks, I'm human. Mm -hmm. And you need to judge me as a, as human, a human being. being. And you do understand the emotion on both sides mm -hmm. and the hollering and the screaming. But your job is to keep the integrity of the game. Yes, keep the playing field level. There's no big eyes and no little U's. We're all the same. You know, I've been at games where I'll use you as an example. Folks like you or whoever, they come on. As soon as you walk on the game and somebody say, oh, we lost. You ain't even blow the whistle yet. Why is that perception there sometimes? Because they're living in the past. They're reliving things that happened to them weeks ago. And they, they, may, they may have seen that same official at, at a game three weeks ago, and they're thinking, he's going to do me again. But 
just got to walk in with an open mind. Tell you a quick story. Um, sure. I had an assignment and someone walked into the gate that I actually grew up with. His son was playing on that particular team and he made a comment. And I took it as a joke and I'm proud of myself for my wit. So I just simply replied back and Norm in a lesser harsh tone than he made his statement. Hey man, don't come in here with that animosity because I will have security exit you out before we kick off. Squashed it off. Because we're not there to be badgered. We're not there to be yelled at all night long. Well, I'm, one of my official buddies had the greatest line of all time to one of the coaches who was yelling at him. Coach, stop yelling at me. If I wanted to be yelled at, I could have stayed home with my wife. I come here for peace. I come here to have fun. I didn't come here to be yelled at. Well, I okay. thought that was a great line. <laughs> well, it's a great line. I hope you hear it. That's a great line. Because someone will yell at you if you don't do that. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to worry about that stuff with my wife. Well, she, I'm she, glad you did. She, she is so loving. That's I, why he's clarifying it right now. I, 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 love, I love her more so, and more each day. So therefore, he's telling you he ain't, he don't have to go out and blow that whistle <laughs> just to get out. Okay, that goes to my next question. You went right into it. How do you, you, I'm asking you, mm -hmm. how do you stay calm and relaxed in all of this? Because but the intensity of, of, of football games, especially football games, because that's what you are, and basketball is the same way, or baseball, the empire calls it a ball strike, whatever, because how do you deal with people that have become so emotional over sports? I try to always keep my calm. I always try to remain cool, you know, try to be that, that person who is going to keep a level head. Um, now, some of my colleagues on the football field don't really have that demeanor, and it's gotten to the point of where the law enforcement had to get involved. Um, I can honestly say, fortunately, that that, that has, hasn't happened to me because I kind of live it on a three-strike rule. Someone will say something, okay, that's one. Someone will do something, okay, that's two. Now, in the third one, I got to go talk to you, whether it's a fan or a coach. Uh, I'll take game management with me, but I got to let you know, this isn't tolerated. You did this the first time, the second time, now the third time. If this continues, I'm going to ask you to leave. And I, I don't think that's exercised enough by my colleagues because it gets to the point of where it can get unsafe sometimes. It gets unsafe for us, gets unsafe for the kids that are playing, it gets unsafe for some, for some of the other adults there but it doesn't have to get to that point. You just have to measure it and say, hey, come on, man, we've had enough. Would you say that the, one of the most important things is respect? Yes, it is. And, and the reason I'm, 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 I'm asking you this, I have a friend, I have a friend that was one of the first African-American NFL referees. And he did some very big games. And he's been with some. And one of the things we were out one night and we were talking, and I said, how do you maneuver this? And this is what he said. He said, before the game, and he named some, I'm talking about some people there that's in the Hall of Fame. And before the game, you know how people talk and whatever. He said, I always told people, I respect you, you respect me. That's it. I respect you, you don't respect me. I'm not going to try to outshowboat you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you knew him, because you don't, I ain't letting you outshowboat me. And I sat there and I said, he said, I just was honest. Everybody knew I was a fair guy. You respect me, I respect you. I'm not trying to get up in your face and I, I ain't going to let you get up in my face. So you think respect is a very important thing. So what would you tell my audience how they should look at a referee, regardless of whatever the sport is. Years ago, when I played high school football, the officials would show up and I kind of watched them. Now I sit back and think about it, kind of watched them, watched the interaction between them and the guys who were coaching me. Um, I kind of watched 
the relationship they had. And it's funny because present day, I still know some of those guys and remember them and kind of remind them and they re kind of remember the games, but maybe not me as an individual, but I watched and they show up, they did the game and they left. They didn't talk to anybody and you're there for at least two and a half, three hours. That's a lot of time in a day, not to talk to anybody, but your colleagues. So to fast forward to present day, from the moment I pull up in the parking lot, I'm talking to people, introducing myself to people, shaking hands, kind of building a bridge. Because if that something goes down, I can count on you to help me diffuse the problem. But is it, would you not say that part of it has also been the perception of how the stadium or the team or the neighborhood has been defined. Yes, that, that plays a major part. So you're saying that your colleagues, I mean, your colleagues should understand, look at it from the overall picture. And that's why I have this program because what happens is we get defined and then people come in already painted to what they perceive. I mean, why do I say that? You know, I went to a predominantly African-American school. Our teams were African-American dominant. And sometimes we felt that the calling was not par. Sometimes we thought it wasn't objective. I'm not going here to say to you it all was objective because I don't believe it was all objective. And I'm going to I believe in that. So, you know, and Mr. Referee over there, he's going to tell you, that, you know, they all got and they all look at it like that. And I don't expect him to say otherwise. I wouldn't expect him to say otherwise because that's the kind of guy he is. But I'm not. I'm the one that's going to say, whoa, every now and then for whatever. And it could have been human nature. It could have been gut reaction or it could have been they didn't see it the way I saw it. Okay. I didn't think the person was in motion, but that's his record. Maybe they was in motion. Maybe. That's why I have you on here tonight, because I want you to encourage us to get involved in becoming referees. I get upset. We talk about police. We talk about firemen. We talk about school teachers. But yet, we don't want to get in the profession. We talk about judges, talk about the district attorney, talk about district justices all the time. I get tired of hearing it. Well, you know, the district justice, he didn't do this, he didn't see it. Well, okay, if he didn't see it the way that you thought he should see it, or she didn't see it, then you need to get involved. You need to run for the judge. Well, you need to support people who look at things in an overall projective way. So. I have you on here for one reason, one reason only, because I wanted you to show a human side of referees. Because most people see referees in the little stripes and that whistle, and they determine the outcome based on your stripes and your whistle, good, bad, or indifferent. And I wanted you to tell the audience, hey, I'm human, I'm just like you, I eat like you. I do all the things just like you. And maybe, maybe, maybe you didn't say this, maybe every now and then I might make a mistake. But I'm human. But at the same time, I'm human, but I'm only going to tolerate so much as well. So that's why I want you to, again, in the best you can, to try to encourage people to become referees. No more than I encourage people that they say their kids can't read and write, but they don't want to help their kids learn how to read and write. So I just want you to humanize refereeing to my audience. And you can tell them it's a noble job. Now, I ain't going to say they get rich, but I just want my audience to know they is getting paid something. Now, I don't want y'all, they all involved. Pay, pay is never important. 
But you understand? He said pay is never important, but they do get paid. I don't want you to think. They do get paid. Not a lot, but they do it. You do it for the love of. Love of the game. Yes, love of working with the children. You do it because of love working for the children, right? So what do you tell my audience? I mean, what do you tell my audience in terms of? Just simply get involved. And once you study for that test and pass that test and learn all the rules, step up and make a difference. Because I, not only you, I, I know a lot of, I know a lot of referees. It could be football. It could be basketball. I even know some empire, you know? Somebody thought it was a ball. Somebody thought it was a strike. But it's a human thing. And I hate to put this label on it, but we really don't care who wins or who loses. That's not your job, right? Right. But every game, there's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. Even at the end of the game, you got to tie. You got to move into overtime. So what he's saying is, there's always going to be a winner and a loser. But his job is to keep it fair. Yes. But at the same time, you say keep it fair. But my whole point is, we got to get involved. We need, we need more referees. We need them more in, in, in the peewee league. And that, need- that's even on the, in the initial part of this conversation, working with the at-risk youths. And there's a lot of police interaction with the child. There's a lot of juvenile probation activity working with that child. If you feel as though that you your child has been mistreated or if that child's been mistreated, you don't have to really work with that probation, that juvenile probation officer. Go to the supervisor and report what took place. Don't have all that answer animosity towards him because he could simply just be doing his job and you disagree with it. But if you do disagree with it, take the next step to find out if he's correct or not. Okay, I'll take that. And at the same time, the night you said that people need to get involved. Get involved. So many of you critic, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but you're saying a lot of the critics up there in the stands become empires, become referees. And then you'll get a different perspective. But the most important thing, they're human. Mm-hmm. And I hear a lot of criticism of who the referees is or who the referees isn't. And I'm not that naive not to say that the system is not flawed sometimes. But one of the things that I had made up my mind reading the other day, when I was reading that, I'll just use Pennsylvania because I have other people that listen to this program other than in Pennsylvania. Um, the Big 33, which is their big all-star game across, and they bring people from all over the state to play football. And all of a sudden, they realized there was no African-Americans. From reading the day, I think there was one Hispanic. But they have a process to becoming, a process to becoming the head coach. That was one thing they said, process. I mean, I... I, I'm for one of these individuals. I, If I can't control it, I don't worry about it. That's something I can't control. But you have organizations out there, the high school athletic directors. If they all get together and take the proper steps, they can make a difference. They, they don't have to tolerate that. I, I agree with you, and that's my point. My point is they're going to – I say they're getting ready to have a diversity committee. I understand all that. We do a lot of committees. I don't need a lot of committees. But my point is, is that – and one of the issues came up, whoop, well, there ain't a whole lot of head football coaches in the 501 school district. I'm just using that example. And there's some truth to that. So I'm saying that a lot of you have to want to be coaches, but you got to get involved. But you also got to be prepared to want to get go to the next level. I hear a lot of people that tell me, I just want to stay in the midget. I don't want to go to high school. I don't want to go to college. I don't want to be college coaches. Or I don't want to be pros. And we have to progressively prepare ourselves to go to each individual. And we have to stop stopping at the low at the bar at the end. If you learn nothing about this conversation tonight, 
we got to step up to the higher bar. There need to be more coaches. There need to be more involvement. And all of a sudden we wake up and say, whoa. So I'm saying to my audience, tell your, your nephews and your nieces and all the other, because they don't have to be male, they got female referees as well, to get involved and become referees. And then you, you might feel that maybe it's a better playing field. I don't know. But we got to get involved. We can't sit on the, on the sidelines and complain and say, oh, all they just sent us was 10 guys opposed to eight guys and two women when no women are in the selection committee or what. So we got to get involved. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. Yes. The first step is getting involved. Getting involved. The second step is you got to take that test. And don't let that test scare you. Anybody, take the test. Go through the process. And I know that we're getting ready to end this program. I'm going to say something, but then I'm going to turn it back to you. One thing that Michael Rucker said this evening is that He's human. He said two things. We're human. I just want to be respected and you respect me. So what would you tell my listen audience as we get ready to close that you want to leave them with? Well, you touched on it, just respect. That, that word goes a very, very long way. If you respect your fellow man, your fellow man will respect you. The, 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 the teams out there, if you go to your supporting cast and ask them to put a plan together if you go respectfully they'll respect you if you got a problem with them and an, an, an official on the football field or a basketball court or an umpire on the baseball field if you go to them respectfully they'll reply to you respectfully it's plain and simple yeah that's what he said so he's saying that because i guess last week somebody killed a coach in lancaster why? Yeah, the game is not that important. It's not that important. It's not that important to get beat up. Not that important to get shot and killed. These people are volunteering your time because they care about kids. And we're only talking the low level here because he refer, you know, he referees high school and he referees midget, right? Yes. And so he cares about the passion of the kids. Because it's not about money. He does it for the love of the game. So next time I go out with him, I'm going to see if he pick up the tab because he got a little bit of money. And no, says, actually, every <laughs> check I gave it goes home to my wife and uh, she puts it into the uh, what we call the Rucker Christmas Club. Okay, he, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, he, he going to say whatever. See, he's letting you know that he ain't trying to act like he got a whole lot of money. But anyway. I want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything you want to say to my audience? Well, I just want to thank you for having me. I'm really impressed with what's going on in here. I've heard some grumblings in the past, and I just kind of ignored it because Richard ain't all that. But now I'm I see, not all that, but now I see he has some, and impressed me with his game. Here's my point. My point is this, and I'm going to end on this. I want us to define who we are. I'm tired of people defining who we are. And if we don't define who we are, then shame on us. But what did we learn from here tonight? That's what I always try to do. We got to get involved. We got to step up to the game. We got to stop staying on the sidelines and complain. So therefore, if we don't like the referees, officials, umpires, no matter what sport, then guess what? Get involved and then you become one. And once you become one, you probably see things from a different perspective. Yes. And I do understand that because there have been times in my life that I probably criticized. But once I became a coach and I would say things, I would tell the kid, go left and the kid go right. And then the people in the stands told me I didn't know what I was doing because I should have told the kid to go left. <laughs> so I understood what you're saying. Yeah, the fans are very, very opinionated. 
and you just have to take it for what it's worth. If you hear it, ignore it, plain and simple. But you, as an official, you shouldn't be listening to that. Um, I'm going to leave on this. Many of you listen to Michael Rucker tonight. Some of you, I think, understand what he said. Some of you still have a hard time. <laughs> and I know that. So I'm going to leave you with this. Then you get involved and you become a referee or empire. And then the ailment will be on you. So thank you. All right. Thank you for Did You Know? And guess what? September and October is coming. And boy, we're going to have some programs now. Because it's about where are we going from here. So thank you for joining. Looking forward to seeing y'all the first Tuesday of September. So have a good evening. We will be here. Well, that was all right. Every first and Not third Tuesday oh, from 6 30 sir. p.m. to 7 30 p.m. <laughs> Remember to visit us on Facebook at Richard Lucky. Yeah, I'm good. That wasn't bad, was it?